Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honour your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. And fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your, earth, your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Render service with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat them the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their and your master is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, one of the things we've noted in Ephesians uh, is that I uh, use a lot of imagery. Uh, one of the most personal images, and perhaps the most radical, I think I'm coming to the conclusion, is the image used in Ephesians 2 verse 19. Christians are members of God's household. Christians are members of God's household. Now, I don't know how your household works, but membership in my household is not something I extend to everyone. There are six. That's it. There are six members of my household. God's the same. He invites all people to join his household, but only those who've had their sins forgiven by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus are members of the household, are members of God's household. And when you think about that, that is a remarkably personal image. Think about your own households. Uh, in order not to use you as examples, I'll use myself. Who sees me in all my morning glory in my pyjamas? Who are the only people who smell my bed breath? Who knows what I have for breakfast? Who sees me when I'm at my best and I'm when I'm at my very ugly worst? You see how personal and intimate the word household is? And Christians are in God's household. That's very personal, very intimate. God's the father of the household. Christians are described as his children and they're to walk representing the household's characteristics, which we've seen over the last few weeks, are love and light. Their membership in God's household then affects the membership of their own house. You remember that from last week? The household of God is the pattern for our own households. Whatever God's household looks like, that's the pattern for our, our own households. Now, if you think about that, that is remarkably radical. I think if you're anything like me, we forget how radical God's eternal picture of his household truly is. And one of the things that's been brought home to me in this last week, just in a number of small words, is how wonderfully radical and transformative the household of God is. Remember last week, live wisely, not foolishly, because the days are limited. Last week we saw what it looked like to gather together as the household of God and what that looked like as we were singing and thankful and submitting household. We saw what that looked like in our own marriages as wives and husbands. We saw that... God, through Paul's writing, is bringing the walk of the household of God down into our lounge rooms, our work relationships, our kitchens, our bedrooms. And at the heart of it last week was that word that our society finds a little bit icky, doesn't it? The word submit. We spent a lot of time thinking about what that looks like as we discern the will of God across the Bible. And submission as a word is, is a description of God's design, not a way of indicating worth or value. It's a description of God's design, not a way of ascribing worth or value. Because men and women are made in whose image? In the image of God. Men, are, men and women are worth what? They're worth the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. And as they live out the roles God's given them, they're actually mutually submitting to each other. 
serving each other so that the household of God is built up to be the place where God dwells forever. This week we come to the next two relationships, children and fathers, slaves and masters. Let me pray and then we'll dive into it. Dear God, thanks for your word. We say this every week. Help us never to tire of it. Help us never to lose the wonder of it. Help us never to feel the sharpness of it by your spirit. Thank you that we can sit here and read your word. Father, please apply it to us. As a household, we come from so many different pressures, so many different desires and expectations in the week ahead. Father, mould us as your household so that we go out into this community and proclaim how good it is to meet Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, there's a sermon outline there on the left-hand side, of, uh, on the inside of your news that I'm at point two on that. Verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, it's not too complicated, is it? Uh, Not many grey areas there. Children, obey your parents. It's the kind of command I needed as a child, perhaps still need as an adult. Honour your father and mother, simple, succinct and clear. But when you think about it, there are some nuances there that I have found really confronting. the The first is this. Uh, It's a command given to who? It's given to children, isn't it? Not parents, go home and tell your kids this. So that means that who was sitting there listening to this being read as the sermon in church? It was the children, wasn't it? It's a terrific image to have. Paul's written this letter. He's in jail, 60, 60 AD, to people he hasn't seen for seven years. He lived with them. Two to three years, writes this letter. Where would they read it? In church. And it paints a picture of church where children, the whole family household, is sitting together as the whole household of God. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's amazing to say that God has written that verse for children to listen to. Not parents to, and this is a second nuance. Not parents to take home as a stick to whack their kids with. (laughs) Remember what we said last week about looking after our own responsibilities and roles? Not making sure that other people were doing theirs properly up to my standard? Children, this is your job. Not parents, make sure you berate your children with this job. The word obey there, that's the word in the red type. Uh, It's repeated there, verse 1, verse 5. Uh, They're the commands. It's a different word to the word submit. Uh, The word submit uh, has a voluntary aspect to it. Choose to enter into this. Obey? No, no, nothing voluntary about this. This is the design that is there, that must be done. And we're given some reasons for that, aren't we? Uh, Three reasons for children to obey. The first is there in verse 1, in the Lord. I think that's pretty radical because children are in the Lord. They're not people to be matured so they can become in the Lord. Children can be full members of God's household, full members in Christ as God designed. That's a pretty different way of viewing children, isn't it? The second reason is there at the back end of verse 1 because this is right. Literally, it's in line with God's design. Uh, It works. Uh, The third reason is that quotation from the book of Exodus, honour your father and mother, verse 2, which is the first commandment with a promise, commandment number 5, that it may go well with you and that you may have long life in the land. It's in your best interest, children because it will lead to a long and good life. And I think the change there to honour is a way of actually dealing with the fact that we grow up, we're independent, we start our own households, but we're always kids, someone's children. Honour your parents. Now, I think that's pretty clear. 
But as I was preparing it this week, there were two questions, or one for each year, just kind of lurking away there. Now, the first question is this. Does this mean that children must obey everything their parents tell them? Well, the obvious answer is yes, but we've got to not be too quick there, don't we? Because there's actually a bigger design. And the bigger design is mentioned there in verse 4, so that they actually come to know and love Jesus. So I, I think the answer is yes, but there is no abuse. Did you hear me say that? It is very important for the household of God to make that clear. As we said last week in the relationship between husbands and wives and the way in which that passage has been misused, this is not a passage that allows abuse. Either way. And we need to hear that clearly as the household of God. Now there's a a second question, and perhaps uh, it's a little pointed, uh, what about those children who do obey their parents but don't have long and blessed lives? It's a question worth asking, isn't it? What about those children who do obey their parents but don't have a long and blessed life? And I think we get the answer mapped out for us as we move into verse 4. Let me read verse 4. And fathers, don't stir up anger in your children but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That should have caught us a little off guard, shouldn't it? It's not parents. Fathers. It's not as if a Paul had a slip with the quill on the papyrus and mucked it up there. Fathers. Fathers. Don't stir up anger in your children and bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We've learned as we started off Genesis, which we're going to work over in a number of years, and we've learned as we've looked at husbands and wives last week that the male is given a role as a husband and a father that is very clear, a role of leadership. His job is made very clear. There's something he must not do. What's that? That, That's very clear in the first part, is it? Don't stir up anger in your children. Don't exasperate them. Now, we need to be clear about that. It's not a statement against a father disciplining a child. But it is a statement against a father over-disciplining a child. Setting unrealistic expectations that can never be met. Being unreasonable. Being overbearing. A A father and a mother are to raise their child to know and love the Lord and that will involve a level of discipline. But don't go beyond the characteristics of the household of God of love and light. Let me give you an example, and people in my Bible study group have heard this, and my family's probably sick of it. But when I was 10, me and Dad butted heads. That's not unusual. Uh, let Let me say very clearly, my childhood was wonderful. I wouldn't change a thing about my relationship with my parents. We butted heads. It was in the bathroom down at Kayama. I was 10. I don't know what it was about. It might have been about the toothpaste, the toothbrush. Who knows? Uh, But dad tore strips off me. Uh, My dad was the kind of guy that when he got angry, he went really quiet. You know, that kind. Uh, I was sent to my room. I had a punishment. About 20 minutes, half an hour later, dad came into the room and opened the Bible with me. Bernard, can I have a chat with you? Which verse did he read? He read verse 4. He didn't read verses 1, 2, and 3 because he was worried about his own responsibility. He read verse 4 and he said, Bernard, I want to ask you for your forgiveness. I exasperated you and stirred you up to anger. Will you please forgive me? How radical is that? That dad would sit and read verse 4 with me and then ask me for forgiveness. It was wonderful. Now, for For me, as you'll learn in a moment, that stood against the backdrop of a father who gathered his family every morning at breakfast to read the Bible. Not not a breakfast went by where we didn't open the Word of God. And we finished breakfast every morning with everyone sharing something they were thankful for and us praying in thanks to God. So that apology stood against that backdrop of a dad who was doing his job. And that leads to what a father must do. Did you notice that, the second part of verse 4? But bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
to know and love and delight in Jesus Christ as the one who has died on the cross for your sins and risen from the dead, so he is the boss of the universe who wants you in the household of God. Nourish them. Literally, the word is feed them the good tucker. Like we've seen a husband should do with his wife in the first part of Ephesians 5. So here's the start of the answer to our second question about children. Remember that question? What about those kids who do obey their parents but don't have long and blessed lives? Don't imagine that the chronology of life here on earth always matches the eternal goodness of dwelling in the household of God. And if a father has done his job, laid before his children and nourished them on the goodness of Jesus Christ, they will live long in the land, in the household of God for all time. Do you see how important the role of the father is? Now, before we get on to slaves and masters, let me just make a couple of observations before we move on to the last relationship. Uh, The first observation is this. The basic building block of the parent-child relationship in the design of God is is the walk the parents have with God. Did you get that? The basic building block of the parent-child relationship in God's design is the relationship the parents have as they walk with God. No mistake that we start with husbands and wives, is it? And then move out in the household. And the assumption is that they're in the household of God and that the father and the mother are modelling the walk that Jesus has called them to as Lord and Saviour. And so that is the basic building block. Their individual walks, their walks as a husband and wife, before their children, the building blocks are established. Which means, the second observation, that our primary job, our primary job in our family households is as husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. Uh, Our world has developed a slightly unhealthy obsession with defining people by their occupation, by their retirement plans, and by their possessions. And it is seductive, isn't it? Uh, Every month, the Australian, the Weekend Australian, puts out a magazine just devoted to opulence. So I can read that and go, I want that. Or if I can't retire there, or if I'm not occupied that way, if my cufflinks don't look like his. God's mob works differently, doesn't it? My primary identity is not my cufflinks. My primary identity is in Christ. I'm a member of his household. And then if I am married, it is as a husband. And then if I have children, it is as a father. And then I happen to earn money for those jobs by being a farmer or an accountant or a council worker. It's crucial to get our identity right. That's why he takes, Paul takes three whole chapters because that is the defining way I make my decisions in life. Does my decision about my work enable me to fulfill my primary responsibility as a child of God, as a husband or a wife, as a father or a mother? Does my decision about this employment enable me to do those responsibilities so that the world sees how wonderful the household of God is? Does my use of time enable that? How much I spend on my PlayStation, how much I spend shooting, how much I spend going to the pub with mates, how much I, to name a few that are seductive. I said this to a young man who was talking to me in a small country town who was talking about how at the end of the day he got home exhausted and so he needed to spend time just winding down with his PlayStation and a beer. Now your first job starts when you walk through the door. as a husband, as a father who is leading a household to know and love Jesus. And that means that Bernard Gabbard 
has to think about the desires he has for his children. What do I desire for my children as a father, as a husband? I desire that they know, as we learnt last night, that there is someone I love more because he will love them more than I ever can. My desire is not for their goodness. My desire is for their godliness. My desire is that they meet Jesus so that they are taken from corpses to their identity in Christ, so they are taken from enemies to sitting down at the table of God. That is my desire, or it should be. Not how many rep teams they're in. Not whether their work ethic is up to scratch. Not how many carnivals we can attend. Not the job they get or the university they get. They are good, but there is a best that they know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And that is the job I am given. Not a job I outsource. Not a job I delegate. But to introduce my children to their eternal father. So how will I do that? Well, let me suggest it is really quite simple. Read the Bible and pray. Personally, and as a household. My abiding memory as we lived in Maroubra, a two-storey house, uh, you had to come down from the bedrooms, down the steps, out the front door, and the lounge room was on the right. I always, I never really wanted to look to my right. It was a horrible image for me with my guilty conscience because there was always mum and dad sitting on the couch reading the Bible. Every morning. The bus to school left at two past eight. I'd invariably run out the door. I only had 50 metres to go at 8 o'clock. And as I ran out the door, mum and dad would say, Bernard, have you read your Bible this morning? Have you prayed? No, mum. Back upstairs, son. They took that responsibility seriously. They were developing a habit at that age, but it's become a delight. And they always modelled it. Individually, as a couple, and as a family. Which brings us to the last relationship. It's the one there in verse 5, 5 to 9, point 3 on the outline. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Render service with a good attitude as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat them the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their and your master is in heaven. There's no favouritism with him. Again, last relationship, fairly simple, isn't it? Not many grey areas. Notice the repetition of that word, obey. I hope we're struck by who's listening in verse 5. Slaves. You know, slaves could sit as equal men and women in church. It hasn't always been the case in history, has it? That's how radical God's household is. That a slave on Monday could sit on Sunday as an equal before God. Made in the image of God. Worth the blood of God's son. Isn't that radical? (laughs) Remarkable in what it implies about how we view people. Uh, there are some principles given, uh, very simple. Uh, Christian slaves and masters, but they, you both belong to Jesus. Slaves, obey us to Christ. Uh, slaves of Christ, masters, well, you got a boss, he's in heaven. Notice that the language there used around Jesus isn't the language of saviour but Lord, the appropriate word to remind people of where they stand. They both, this is the second principle, both serve Jesus. If he's their boss, they answer to him and they serve him and Notice that on the last day, slaves and masters will stand shoulder to shoulder to give an account for how they've lived. No favouritism. So slaves, when you go home and you work, view your master as someone whose identity is in Jesus and he deserves the best and work like it. Masters, 
Do not view your slave as a fellow Christian whom you can manipulate or presume upon in terms of grace. They are someone bought by the blood of Jesus. Do not intimidate them. Do not exploit them. Do not deceive them. Do not manipulate them. You are fellow members of the household of God. Now, in our town, thankfully, there's no directly synonymous relationship. There's no slavery in this sense. If I was in another part of the world, there would be, wouldn't there? Still exists. And I'd apply this slightly differently. But I think the best place we can apply it, or the closest way we can apply it, is in that employee-employer relationship, isn't it? Again, grasp how radical this is. Grasp how radical this is in an employee and employer relationship as Christians in Christ. That might be remarkably, uncomfortably unique in our town, mightn't it, in terms of decisions we make? And those relationships, as we come to an end, those relationships of the household of God worked out in that community out there, those relationships will speak volumes, won't they? I was connected for a period of time in a small town where there were two godly men in the church. One was known in the community who paid the award wages. The other was known as someone who paid well above. To everyone. When one of them opened their mouths to talk about God, who listened? Who was effective? It was a remarkable display of the household of God being worked out in the wider community that brought amazing fruit. Amazing fruit. I want to finish, before I open it up for questions, uh, I want to finish by emphasising how radical this is. I hope you've grasped it. In the household of God, Because everyone is alike in sin and alike saved by the death and resurrection of the one true Son of God. Husbands and wives, children and fathers, slaves and masters are to sit together in the household. To be the household. To exist as a display of the goodness of the love and light of God. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. I thank you for applying it to me this week and for reminding me of the radical nature of the relationships that you rework here for eternity. Father, help us to celebrate the goodness of being in your household, to make wise decisions as the days are short about our relationships in that household, and to do so in such a way that everyone in our community knows that this is a place you will meet the light and love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Any questions? Staff meeting tomorrow, mate. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yes, Neil, go. Um, Yeah, so the question is, uh, one father will bring up children, plural, and they will know and love Jesus. Uh, Well, they'll be introduced to that, and then one will walk away from the Lord and one will walk with the Lord. Uh, Can I offer some comments on that? Uh, I I think uh, two, two things are worth observing. The first is this passage is very clear about our jobs, isn't it? My job as a father is not to give my child a regenerate heart. That's God's job. My job is to put before my children the good news of Jesus, which God can use to regenerate their heart. So my job is to do that constantly. And and in case people are hearing me speak as someone who doesn't have experience about that, talk to me over morning tea about my family, my birth family. So I think that's very clear in the passage that Our responsibility is clear and God will do the saving through that. Secondly, does that mean that if I do my job equals saved? No. As we learned right at the start, it is God who saves people. My job is to tell people. 
And so, for example, with one older Christian couple, three children, eldest child who is not a believer, though they walked with the Lord obviously all their lives, they're now in their early 50s. What do those parents do for that child, the youngest two, walking with the Lord? What do those parents do? They put the good news in front of this 52-year-old every time they see her. They pray for her daily. They bail her out of all the disasters she might have experienced. They show her the undeserved grace that God has shown us constantly because they continually throw themselves upon the mercy of God. So that's as much as I could say. That's that. Yeah. Does that answer a bit of the question? Yeah. Any other questions or queries? Pete. Yep. So Pete's question is, um, if uh, a child is hearing this and seeks to obey their parents, but their parents don't walk with the Lord, what does that look like? Is that, is, have I got the question? Yep. So I think, uh, I think three things. I, li- I like to use things to say that because it gives me time to order my thoughts. Uh, I think the first thing is to recognise that in the context, Paul seems to assume that parents and kids are in the household together. Okay. So he's writing to the house church in Ephesus, the community as they meet. It was then passed around the churches in modern-day Turkey, it seems. And so there's an assumption there about that. I think secondly, uh, I think when we bring in, remember last week you asked a similar question about husbands and wives, one not being a believer, and I took you to 1 Peter, and we talked about how the behaviour of the believer lays the gospel before the unbeliever all the time. I think that sits here. And so obeying your parents within that grand design of God in such a way that you display the grace of God constantly is is a terrific reminder. I think, too, thirdly, the relationship with our parents doesn't change. They're still our parents, aren't they? And so there's a whole life to display this because there's a movement from obey to honour, isn't there? So even as we deal with our parents as we grow and mature and start our own families, we can lay the gospel before them all the time by how we conduct ourselves. And that's always, as we'll learn next week in Ephesians 6, that's always uh, circumscribed, enveloped or covered in constant prayer. Okay? So I think they're the three things I'd say now, but follow me up afterwards if you've got any other questions.